Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us in this Innovation in Wound Care Summit. Uh, this is a global event which is going to be happening over the next six months, and it's going to be ta tackling all the um, difficult topics in wound care. And essentially, we've got global experts, and then we're really looking forward to having you interacting with us in this immersive experience. So thanks for joining us tonight, and we have got an uh, absolutely amazing global panel of experts joining us. And um, we're going to be starting off with uh, Dr. Wendy Cole, who's uh, doing a segment on biofilm. It's a short segment, but it really just sets the foundations uh, appropriately for the rest of our topics. And then we've got a really fantastic session by um, Trish Inderson, who's joining us from Balato in South Africa. Um, Trish is a real um, para force uh, in wound care and she's such a great um, teacher in terms of covering really essential topics in a really simplified format and she's going to be taking us through some case-based um, discussions. We're going to be discussing how to assess a wound adequately, who needs debridement and an overview of debridement techniques. And then we'll be going to uh, Dr. Eliza Lee who is a global wound expert who works in the Veterans Association um, healthcare system. She's based in Virginia. She is uh, uh, yeah, a fantastic researcher and she's done a lot of work on the challenging clinical scenario for debridement. And she's gonna give us some tips on how to do that safely. Um, and then finally, we've got Dr. Neil Lonke and Dr. Tracy Kimball. And they're both, both fantastic um, wound care experts who've basically um, Going to give us a glance into the future of debridement just to look at, at types of technology that will be coming our way. Um, they've got evidence base in other aspects of medicine. Um, so we're really going to, I think, enjoy having this, this time together. Um, so don't forget to sign up for free uh, with us at woundmasterclass.com forward slash register and then you'll have access to the Wound um, Masterclass Academy which essentially is a collection of our podcasts, all our sessions which we've done um, for the last year and also have access to our journal um, which is quarterly uh, so it's peer reviewed and indexed and um, gives you the free access to material, there's no subscription um, so you can have access for free essentially and don't forget to register for our next event which is on June 21st which is on um, palliative care and it's essentially looking at the solutions to some common problems in managing palliative care patients for wounds um, so that's happening on the 21st of June and we'll put a link in the chat um, below so tell us where you're from where you're joining us from, what kind of practice you have. We'd love to interact with you, but we'll go straight over now to Dr. Wendy Cole to talk to us about um, biofilm, that's right. Um, so she'll give us a very quick snapshot. So over to Dr. Wendy Cole. So what is a biofilm and what changes when bacteria enter into a biofilm construct? Well, a biofilm is a colony of this tenacious polymicrobial, so multiple organisms, bacteria, fungus, yeast that form on the wound surface. So planktonic bacteria or free floating bacteria will uh, implant on, on the surface of a wound or a surgical incision. Um, and then they start to connect with one another and uh, they do something that's called form sensing. They start to share information. They could share DNA, RNA, they could sh share uh, antibiotic resistance as well. And they start to mutate and then they start to secrete something called an extra polymeric substance. And this extra polymeric substance, it's kind of like this wound ooze or goo that kind of forms this um, microdome that protects this biofilm. Interestingly enough, the organisms within a biofilm are not affected by oral and IV antibiotics. And, and, and some topical antibiotics or antimicrobials have a difficulty penetrating through the biofilm uh, construct because of this extra polymeric substance. So these wounds 
initially are not necessarily infected, but they are contaminated with, with surface bacteria. The number and complexity of the microbes that are involved in this biofilm on the surface increases the patient's risk of, of developing a wound infection. And then we also know that the presence of biofilm uh, will cause inflammation and cause wounds to be chronic. So if we have biofilms that are uh, in the area of a surgical incision, if we allow them to develop, if we don't treat them appropriately, we can get incision site infections or SSIs. We can also get inflammation that continues and these wounds won't heal. And that becomes a, a particularly problematic situation for, for a lot of our patients postoperatively. So the idea of wound hygiene has really been taking hold in the wound care space. And I think we should translate wound hygiene and post-operatively too. Um, I'm not convinced we're doing a great job uh, to treat our post-operative incision sites to prevent biofilm formation and, and to uh, really practice good wound hygiene. So in order to remove biofilms, we must practice good wound hygiene. And this is a systemic approach uh, where the strategy consists of wound cleansing, uh, both the wound and the peri-wound tissue. Uh, you would be surprised if you had special imaging to see, you know, the bacteria content on any body part. Not only is the incision site potentially affected or infected with uh, pathologic levels of bacteria, but the peri-wound is too. So we have to use antimicrobial washes, surfactants to loosen the devitalized tissue and debris in the surgical site or surgical incision, but also in that peri-wound tissue so that bacteria doesn't seed into the incision site. On occasion, we might need to debride the wound, especially if we had a, a wound dehiscence because of an infection. So we want to do mechanical, sharp, enzymatic, even potentially biologic debridement if you choose as, as a health uh, care professional uh, to remove all that devitalized tissue because that is a nidus for infection. That's where bacteria like to kind of live and grow and replicate and, and cause problems. Uh, and then choosing the appropriate dressing too. We need to manage exudate. Uh, we need to control the exudate, remove the exudate from the incision site. And a, a lot of uh, newer bandages that are entering into the market also have antimicrobial properties that can help to assist in uh, wound hygiene and uh, hopefully prevent biofilm bacteria from reforming and help to uh, control any kind of surgical site infection. So wound hygiene is so important. It's every time, every patient, every wound, and we have to be consistent with that if we're going to be successful. Thanks, Dr. Cole. And now over to Trish and Desone to talk about how to assess a wound and an overview of debridement. Greetings to you around the globe. I am Trish Eitensen, a wound nurse specialist in private practice in Belito, KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, and the principal lecturer and coordinator of the Wound Care course for the University of the Free State. My disclosure. Consent has been obtained for all photographs within this presentation according to the Protection of the Personal Information Act. I am and have been a consultant and speaker for the following companies, 3M, Essity and Smith & Nephew. Welcome to Wound Bed Preparation with a focus on debridement. Our learning objectives will be to review the importance of wound bed preparation, understand the significance of necrotic tissue, recognize the importance of debridement, and describe and appraise types of debridement. So why is wound bed preparation important? Wound bed preparation is a valuable bedside tool that's been around for years that guides clinical practitioners with a holistic, systematic, evidence-based approach to apply to the assessment and treatment of both the patient and their chronic wound to optimize healing. Over the last 23 years, wound bed preparation models have been updated and adapted frequently. These are a few of the most recent best practice guidelines and consensus publications that include how important it is to take a comprehensive history and assessment 
of both the patient and the wound, to determine the healability of the wound, evaluate and manage the patient and social factors, and identify and treat the cause. The diagnosis of the cause may be approached from a systemic and regional cause assessment first, followed by the local cause assessment. These are examples of a few of the etiologies that are critical to manage to advance wound healing. Systemic examples. I'm sure we're all aware of diabetes mellitus, one of the main causes of delayed wound healing. Malnutrition occurring in the over or the undernourished. For example, inadequate protein. Vitamin A, C and zinc affects normal collagen synthesis needed for extracellular matrix formation. Due to albumin longer half-life, it's used for long-term malnutrition assessment. Connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, age, and certain medications. For example, chronic anticoagulants, skin necrosis that's associated with the intake of warfarin. From a regional aspect, venous, arterial, neuropathic, lymphatic, or it can be a combination of any of these. The local causes could be pressure, infection, trauma, foreign body, self-harming wound, also known as factitious wounds, or the presence of orthopedic hardware. It is critical to manage the underlying causes to advance wound healing. As I mentioned earlier, the wound bed concept and acronym has been adapted, changed frequently, which includes time to times, which included the surrounding skin, named in the triangle of the wound assessment as the peri wound, and defined in 2021 by ISTAP, the International Skin Tear Advisory Panel, as the area around a wound that may be affected by wound-related factors and or underlying pathology. Timers then excluded the surrounding skin, the periwound and the acronym, and added the critical aspect of the repair of tissue in the management of hard to heal wounds. T stands for tissue, I inflammation, infection, M moisture, E edges, R regeneration, repair of tissue, and S for social factors. Our expected outcomes should be considered the optimal goal of care to enhance healing. That is to convert the non-viable tissue to viable tissue, control inflammation, infection and biofilm, restore moisture balance, advance the edges of the wound to reduce the wound size and repair, regenerate tissue to assist, accelerate and achieve wound closure whilst maintaining the integrity of the periwound. By reducing the persistent inflammatory state and encouraging these conditions that are conducive to healing, by using this paradigm, the chronicity cycle can be broken. Each of these pillars of timers, including the peri wound, are equally as important as each other to advance healing, which is why many other best practice documents and global consensus have been published on each of them. As time is limited today, here are a few examples as further recommended reading that are freely available on the relevant websites. This presentation will focus on tissue, specifically necrotic tissue, and the types of debridement. So let's talk the T. It's essential as wound care practitioners to identify different tissue types. This guides us in our management to cleanse. Are we going to debride or not debride? What type of debridement are we going to select? And what extent of the tissue are we going to debride? And what dressing are we going to choose? Actually, there's a lack of consensus regarding tissue types, their terminology, practice, and molecular level of knowledge. Tissue is described and documented by color, consistency, and adherence, and terminology is important. The colour varies according to depth and type of the tissue affected. It can be white, yellow or black. The darker the tissue, the deeper the damage. An example of this would be a pressure injury. Consistency is influenced by the interaction of the selected dressing and the hydration of the wound bed. 
if there's no dressing and the wound is exposed, the tissue becomes dehydrated. Adherence is assessed by how easy the debris can separate from the wound bed. The more adherent the necrotic tissue, the deeper and more severe the damage is, and the lower the moisture level. Etiology, as well as the degree of tissue death, influence clinical appearance necrosis. Granulation tissue is our goal. Good quality granulation is viable, highly vascular, moist, can be pink to red. I always describe this to the patient as it appears like the outside of a strawberry. I think it's important to get your patient's buy-in and let them understand what tissue you're looking for. I had a patient once with a necrotic wound, 100% necrosis, and I said, we're looking for the outside of that strawberry. Well, the day that we could see 100% granulation, he went out and bought a pallet of strawberries and brought them to the clinic. Whilst hypergranulation, also referred to as overgranulation or proud flesh, is the proliferation of granulation tissue to the point that tissue progresses above or over the wound edge and inhibits epithelialization. This presents as red and shiny and soft, spongy and friable tissue above the level of the skin. Friable meaning it's easy bleeding. The cause may not only be infection, but inflammation, occlusion or even cellular imbalance. Epithelium is seen on the far right, deep pink to pearly pink in appearance. And in this case, I like it to the pink tissue paper. Light purple from edges and full thickness wounds, though. It's fragile but attached, just like tissue paper. It can break easily, so with debridement, we need to be able to recognize this fragile epithelium. Epithelium islands may form in superficial wounds. This is where epithelial cells arise from hair follicles and glands. And one needs to identify these to prevent damage whilst cleaning and debriding. Necrotic tissue is under-researched. Necrotic comes from the Greek word nekros, which means death. Necrosis is unnatural or premature cell death triggered by external factors like trauma, thermal effects, for example, hypothermia or frostbite. And ischemia, impairment of the circulation, can cause gangrene. Internal factors, toxins, infections, for example, wet gangrene. And immune systems, like scleroderma, digital ulcers. Necrotic tissue is divided into two groups. Ishgar can be black, brown, grey in colour, leathery, dry and hard, or moist and mushy in consistency and may or may not be firmly adherent to the wound bed and all the edges. Slough is not clearly defined, but currently is defined by the International Wound Infection Institute as non-viable tissue of varying colour, for example cream, yellow, greyish or tan. This may be loose or firmly attached, slimy, stringy or fibrinous. Often the slimy is referred to as mucinous too resembling mucus. Slough can be found not only in chronic wounds, but also in acute wounds, such as skin tears and other traumatic wounds, dehist surgical wounds, and skin grafts. It will be a miss of me not to mention hyperkeratotic tissue. Hyperkeratosis is also considered as a condition where the overproliferation of keratinocytes cause increased thickening of the stratum corneum the outer layer of the skin. This non-viable tissue occurs in 20 to 80 percent of patients' lower limbs, according to the All Wales Tissue Viability Nurse Forum, and can progress to infection, skin breakdown, and cellulitis. More often seen on the peri-wound area of lower limbs that stems from chronic inflammation or chronic physical damage, such as friction or chemical damage, from the use of aggressive soaps, or a side effect from medication, like chemotherapy. It appears red with grey or brown scales and can be dry, flaky or firmly adherent. Corns and calluses are forms of hyperkeratosis, 
with more of a dry waxy appearance and more often occur with a triad of causes neuropathy pressure and deformity chronic wounds may have several tissue types within the same wound bed as you can see here in each of these wounds there's granulation slough eschgar and in this one tendon and in this wound bone remembering that tendon and bone are tissue and can be non-viable and viable too and also require debridement when they're non-viable so does wound etiology affect the type of necrosis yes it does circulation influences the tissue type dry ischemic gangrene is seen in ischemic arterial wounds caused by the progressive occlusion of peripheral arterial blood supply to the distal tissue it characterizes that thick mummified dry ischgar ischgar is found in, in venous wounds because it becomes desiccated not due to ischemia unless it's a mixed ulcer and this is one with a venous and an arterial component whilst necrosis does not normally present in neuropathic ulcers hyperkeratotic tissue does as i mentioned earlier and in pressure injuries necrotic tissue is indicative of depth how does necrotic tissue affect healing necrosis can be very disturbing for the patient and clinically challenging for the clinician as it inhibits the penetration of topical antimicrobials although necrotic tissue is not biofilm Different bacterial genera, typical of wound pathogens such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the deeper tissues, Staph aureus in more superficial tissue, Enterobacter and Streptococcus species provides a focus for infection. Necrotic tissue exacerbates the inflammatory environment with the constant release of matrix metalloproteinases and inflammatory cytokines and mechanically obstructs granulation tissue growth as well as wound contraction and re-epithelialization and therefore impedes the wound healing process understanding the effects of necrotic tissue guides us to target therapies and invest in wound cleansing and debridement to promote healing interestingly recent research on slough its composition analysis and effects on healing by members of the iwii report slough to contain a diverse and complex set of proteins. They detected higher levels of prevalent proteins in slough samples from wounds that healed, compared to wounds that worsened over time. These proteins were involved in wound healing, skin structure, cell adhesion, and the reduction of inflammation. This provides preliminary evidence that the composition of slough may serve as a marker for wound healing outcomes. For those of you interested in this further or you're wanting to read this interesting research and highly recommended read with unique data, it is freely available from the IWI website on www.woundinfection-institute.com and the Wounds International website on www.woundsinternational.com. Although wound cleansing is taken as the first intervention to achieve the expected outcome of a viable clean wound bed, there is little high quality evidence on cleansing to prove this, and the topic of cleansing requires further research. It is currently defined as actively removing surface contaminants, loose debris, non-attached non-viable tissue, microorganisms and or remnants of previous dressings from the wound surface and its surrounding skin. The peri wound. Vigorous therapeutic wound cleansing is recommended for the cleansing of those chronic hard to heal wounds, wounds that exhibit signs and symptoms of local wound infection and or contain slough, debris or contaminated matter. This is a form of mechanical debridement, so be careful not to harm the wound bed through excess trauma. Swabbing or soaking with wet gauze may be inadequate. A volume of 50 to 100 mils per centimeter of wound length of solution is recommended. 
Mechanical irrigation applied at a force of 4 to 5 pounds per square inch, that's in PSI, is recommended. An easy to use guide regarding the sizing to pressure can be found in the IWII 2022 consensus document and it guides you on what size syringe to use with what size needle to give you the recommended PSI. So what does one clean with? Well, the recommendation is a cleansing solution that is selected and used should be based on local policy and resources available. Debridement is a fundamental intervention of wound bed preparation. Debridement is defined as the removal of devitalized or non-viable tissue from or adjacent to a wound, being the peri-wound. Aggressive initial and serial debridement, so ongoing debridement, is known as the foundation of wound care. But why do we remove devitalized tissue and why should we debride? The definition continues to state why we should debride, and that's because when we debride, we also remove exudate and bacterial colonies like biofilm from the wound bed, and by doing this, promotes a stimulatory environment. Biofilms can be deep within the extracellular matrix of necrotic tissue and other tissue. So by removing the biofilm, debridement opens a window of opportunity to increase the efficacy of systemic antimicrobials and in particular topical antiseptics which help prevent the spreading and reseeding of biofilm after debridement. Different types of debridement have different effects on biofilm and the effect on the biofilm depends at what stage in the biofilm development cycle debridement actually takes place. It doesn't remove all the biofilm so debridement can't be used alone which is why it's important to use a topical antiseptic after debridement if the wound is locally infected. Debridement removes that physical barrier to healing, so it provides a conducive environment for the proliferation of the granulation tissue and the edge advancement. It also reduces malodor, and that, as you know, improves quality of life. The goal of debridement choice is to select and use the most effective type of debridement with the least side effects that can be performed at the simplest site of service. Selection of a debridement method should be based on the goals of care, the clinician's expertise, competence, local resources, government regulations, and the, the facility's policies, as well as the clinical context. The general health of the patient, the underlying cause. Is the wound healable? If yes, active debridement is suggested. For a maintenance wound, conservative debridement, and for non-healable wounds, only comfort removal of slough. The characteristics of the wound should be considered. The tissue type, eschgar, slough, necrosis, hard eschgar. The anatomical location of the non-viable tissue, the size and depth of the wound, is there tendon or a major vessel or nerve in that area, the presence of infection, biofilm and the implementation of biofilm based wound care. Is wound pain experienced? Do they require topical eutectic preparation, a general anaesthetic? Or are they neuropathic and have no sensation at all, enabling debridement at the bedside? And then there are always times when we should heed caution and avoid debridement. The non-infected ischemic foot ulcer that has inadequate tissue oxygenation covered with dry eschgar, these toes will auto-amputate themselves. When palliative management is the goal of care and necrosis covers vulnerable vascular structures, these wounds should not be debrided. Caution in wounds with uncontrolled inflammatory causes, for example, pyoderma gangrenosum, as they display pathogy. The inflammatory component needs to be suppressed first before engaging conservative shark debridement. 
patients on anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy who have an increased risk of bleeding. If the wound is large and the INR is over 2.5, this is a possible contraindication for sharp debridement. There are various methods of debridement. Each requires varying levels of expertise and has the advantages and disadvantages in terms of ease of use, the time it takes, patient acceptability, and the effect on biofilm. At this time, there's no clinical evidence that supports any one debridement method as more effective than the other or the optimal frequency of debridement. Although with chronic wounds, we know that the more frequent the debridements, the better the healing outcome. So let's discuss each of these methods of debridement. Surgical debridement. This is performed in an operating room or specialized clinic by qualified practitioners. This is usually with the use of sterile scissors, scalpel, curette, or a tangential hydrosurgical device. This method requires general or local anesthetic, results in bleeding, is expensive, and as you can see here, is definitely non-selective. Using a tangential hydrosurgical device is advantageous, especially in large wounds with a thin layer of necrotic tissue, where precision is necessary to preserve viable tissue or when tangential excision is required, for example in burns or in this child on the face, this child that had Stephen Johnson syndrome. Surgical debridement inclusive of hydrosurgical debridement is fast and efficient. It maximizes asepsis, removes foci of infection, and disrupts biofilm. If all tissue is removed, biofilm and the deeper tissues can be disrupted. Sharp debridement is performed by qualified practitioners too. Can be advanced practice nurses, podiatrists, medical practitioners, this is performed with aseptic technique using sterile scissors, scalpel, and or a curette. Sharp debridement may require local anesthetic. It has limited selectivity and may result in bleeding. Whilst conservative sharp debridement aims to remove loose necrotic tissue without resulting in bleeding or pain. Sharp debridement is also fast and efficient. Also disrupts biofilm and removes foci of infection, and if all non-viable tissue is removed, disruption of the biofilm can occur. Whilst conservative sharp debridement will remove and disrupt superficial biofilm only. Autolytic debridement occurs naturally. It's the body's own endogenous proteolytic enzymes produced by phagocytic cells. They degrade and remove non-viable tissue, but can be assisted by the application of topical agents and wound dressings that promote the enzymes within the wound to digest necrotic tissue, for example, moisture balancing dressings, like hydrogel, hydrocolloids, hydroresponsive dressings. In this photo series here is a patient who had a high level of fear with a spider bite, so we used hydrogel and a transparent film dressing. And within three days, you can see the wonderful response we had. Fiber gelling dressings like hydrofiber and alginates and polyabsorbent fibers. These polyabsorbent fibers also have a continuous cleansing action. Honey, cadexima iodine and antiseptic and surfactant solutions can be used for autolytic debridement. These are antimicrobial autolytic agents also aid in infection control. Although autolytic debridement is slow and may cause peri-wound maceration, it is highly selective, pain-free, inexpensive and causes no bleeding. It has varying effectiveness in controlling biofilm. And due to the impaired physiology of a chronic wound and its milieu, its role to manage a chronic wound is really quite limited. Mechanical debridement is the use of mechanical force to remove non-viable tissue. Mechanical debridement is non-selective. It can be done with or without anesthesia and at some level disrupts and removes biofilm. Many types of mechanical debridement exist. 
moistened gauze with aggressive circular contact known as therapeutic cleansing that we discussed previously and therapeutic irrigation can be used in conjunction with other debridement methods and should be followed by the application of topical antiseptic dressings to enhance microbial reductions and to suppress regrowth of the biofilm in locally and infected wounds. Debridement pads can be monofilament, microfiber or foam. These improve the patient comfort as they are relatively painless to use. They are easy to use and they provide rapid results. Sluffy tissue, including biofilm in the wound and eczematous surrounding skin, may be debrided with these pads. I often recommend them for use of the patient in the home environment. Wet to dry gauze is not recommended. It can be painful on removal, destroys viable superficial tissue and is time intensive. Low frequency ultrasound units are expensive and require a sterile or clean condition and sterile saline to propagate the sound waves. This causes cavitation in the tissue to disrupt the necrotic tissue, which poses a risk of aerosolization and one requires protection from the particulate matter, airborne bacterial pathogens and bacterial contamination. If sterilizing facilities are available, reusable handpieces may reduce cost. Non-contact ultrasound uses an atomized saline spray to assist debridement. Negative pressure wound therapy systems are known to have a mechanical debridement effect. NPWT, ID, that's installation and debridement systems, have a combination delivery of installation, cleansing and mechanical debridement at the wound surface that cleanses the wound, disrupts and removes non-viable tissue and exudate. This is a patient with a stage 4 sacral pressure injury with profuse staph aureus, scanty Kleb pneumonia and streptococcus pyogenes cultured. NPWT ID was set to instill PHMB solution for a soak time of 15 minutes every three and a half hours at a pressure of 125 millimeters of mercury. This on the day of application and four days later. Thanks to my colleagues in South Africa for providing this impressive case. An effective treatment. Enzymatic debridement is the application of exogenous enzyme to the surface of necrotic wound tissue that works synergistically with endogenous proteolytic enzymes to degrade necrotic tissue. Enzymatic debridement is not widely available globally and can be used adjunct to surgical debridement. It is selective and has some level of disruption and removal of biofilm. It's painless or, when using bromelain, has been reported to have minor pain if the wound is small. Bromelain and collagenase are most common enzymatic debriders. Collagenase enzymatic debridement is relatively slower than mechanical or instrument debridement and in some countries requires a prescription and that may be restrictive. It may cause irritation or periwound maceration and requires frequent daily dressings, sometimes daily and sometimes three, day, three times a day, depending on which collagenase one's using. It's definitely spider bite season in our area. This is another spider bite to demonstrate the same wound type with a different method of debridement, producing good results. The first was applied in the clinic and the second application the patient applied at home. It's very easy to use. One must be sure to read the package inserts as there are many incompatible substances including antiseptics, topical and systemic antimicrobials and heavy metals, for example, iodine. Bromelain is a group of enzymes mixed with a vehicle gel 1 to 10 and is applied at the bedside evenly onto necrotic tissue at a thickness of 1.5 to 3 millimeters. Wounds are then covered with an occlusive film for four hours and then removed. The active enzymes cannot penetrate intact keratin. Its activity is limited to a few hours 
and together with its Ishka specificity, it has been proven to be safe and effective and completes the debridement phase in a single four-hour application. Chemical surfactant debridement is when surfactant wound cleansers and gels of low or high concentration that disrupt non-viable tissue, microbials and debris in combination with mechanical activity. I mentioned the combination earlier when discussing negative pressure wound therapy mechanical debridement. The chemical surfactant may augment the removal of the de debris when combined with negative pressure wound therapy. Chemical surfactant debridement is selective, inexpensive, and also disrupts and removes some level of biofilm. It is slower than other methods of debridement and may cause periwound maceration. Consider using a skin barrier product when selecting this method, and consider that some contain active preservatives and or microbials. Biosurgical or biological debridement is the application of medical grade fly larva. For example, Lucilia cerocata and Lucilia coprina. These excrete proteolytic enzymes to digest and liquefy necrotic tissue. The liquefied tissue is then ingested by the larva. Larval therapy can be left in the wound for two to three days. It is faster than some other non-surgical debridement methods and is selective. In vitro and clinical studies provide evidence of biofilm removal. It is not indicated for ischemic wounds or for infected wounds that have not been treated systemically. Unfortunately, they are relatively costly, difficult to source and cannot debride callus. And they may not be acceptable for some patients having the thought of creepy crawlies in their wounds. Low-grade pyrexia may occur due to the lysis of the organism by the larva, and skin irritation may occur if in contact with the skin. A skin barrier product may assist and hydrocolloid dressing application around the edges of the wound may also prevent the skin, as well as those free-range applications of the roaming larva escaping. So there's two different applications. One is free range, in other words, they're not contained. And the others, as in this picture here on the slide, are contained within almost a tea bag form. The contraindications include open abdominal cavity wounds, pyoderma gangrenosum in patients receiving immunopressive treatment, and septic arthritis. This patient here had radionecrosis following removal of a melanoma two years previously. She developed a wound, did not heal despite multiple hospital admissions for debridement. Many wound care products were used, sterile larval therapy was then applied, and this is the result in two days. The patient was skin grafted post this um, management and completely healed. Two days. That looks like really fast results. Thanks to Cindy Bradley, also in South Africa, for this case. And what about debridement for the future? The recent consensus document on chronic wounds recommends a drive of innovative efforts to reduce debridement in hospital settings and rather refer for debridement to be performed in the outpatient clinic and home-based setting. And with technology developing so fast, why not? A cost-effective biomarker based debridement to identify tissue viability with receptive receptors. Now that sounds exciting and most useful. Thank you for your time and attention and I look forward to your participation in the interactive discussion. Thank you, Trish, for a fantastic segment there. Uh, we're going to just ask for your opinion, the audience who's watching us. And uh, I see you're watching us from a whole host of countries, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, so let's ask how many of you debride your wounds. Uh, so number one, weekly, two, bi-weekly, three, just as needed, or four, you can't or you don't. Um, so we'd love to hear uh, your questions in your, your answers in the chat.
Um, great. And then we go on to the next question, which will be, what tools do you use for your debridement? Is it one, scalpel or dermal curette? Two, just goals, dry goals. Three, hydromechanical tools. Um, is it four, biological? Five, enzymatic? Six, any combination of the above? Uh, so let us know in the chat. And then we'll have the third question coming up as have you ever used Kitasan based products in your practice? Yes or no? Great. And then we're going to go on to welcome Dr. Eliza Lee. Um, so Dr. Lee, thank you very much for joining us. We're delighted to welcome you here. Um, you're going to be talk talking to us about debriding in the challenging clinical setting. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to speak today on debridement and for our sponsors for this event for the non-restricted educational grants that made this global and innovative wound care summit possible. You know, I actually love what I do and I wanted to share my findings with you. So I wrote an article, it had great positive feedback. So here I am today, invited to share my results with all of you. You know, it's not often you find something new that changes the way that you practice. Now I have no current disclosures as it pertains to this topic. I do have one disclaimer, however. The material is a result of work supported with resources and the use of facilities at the Salem Veteran Affairs Medical Center. Before I dive in, how many of you debride your wounds weekly, bi-weekly, as needed, or not at all? My patients will actually tell you I'm not happy until I make them bleed. Do you selectively debride your wounds where you take one piece apart and maybe one from this area and you skip over others? What tools do you use to debride? How many of you practice evidence-based medicine follow published guidelines. I'm sure all of you are raising your hands right now. So let's start this topic with a review of the recommendations. There are several wound care guidelines and they all strongly recommend debridement as standard of care. The International Working Group of the Diabetic Foot, they recommend that you should remove sloth, necrotic tissue and surrounding callus of a diabetic foot ulcer with sharp debridement in preference to other methods taking relative contraindications such as pain, severe ischemia into account. What's nice about their recommendations is that they use evidence-based medicine. They use what's called the grade system. They provide the rationale for how they arrived at each recommendation, which is based on the evidence from the systematic review, expert opinion where evidence was not available, and a careful weighing of the benefits and harms, patients' preferences, and costs related to the innovation of the diagnostic method they're given strong or weak recommendations. So this recommendation is a strong recommendation, but with low evidence support. What was their rationale for this recommendation? Their current expert opinion recommends that sharp debridement should be adopted in preference to other techniques, particularly as this is the least expensive of the methods available, and it's available in all geographic areas. Now the Wound Healing Society they have the focus on clinical and basic science of wound healing. They have a number of these guidelines that we will explore, and they're actually based on the type of wound. At the time of publishing, most past approaches relied only on human studies. Laboratory or animal studies were not cited. They included well-controlled animal studies that actually presented proof of principle, especially when a clinical series worked alongside with the laboratory result. So the strength of evidence supporting a guideline is listed as level one, which is the highest, level two, and then level three lacking sufficient data. So what is the Wound Healing Society's guideline on the diabetic foot ulcer? Initial debridement for the diabetic foot ulcer is required to remove the obvious necrotic and excessive bacterial burden and cellular burden of dead and senescent cells. Maintenance debridement is needed to maintain the appearance and readiness of the wound bed for healing. The healthcare provider can actually choose from a number of debridement methods to include surgical, enzymatic, mechanical, biologic, or autolytic. More than one debridement method may be appropriate. So the Wound Healing Society includes initial and maintenance and is an 
a la carte style of recommendation. Guideline 4.2 is level one evidence. Sharp surgical debridement is preferred. Here, the principle is that necrotic tissue, excessive bacterial burden, senescent cells, and cellular debris can all inhibit wound healing. The method of debridement chosen may depend on the status of the wound, the capability of the healthcare provider, the overall condition of the patient, and professional licensing restrictions. They actually recognize that it may not always be the surgeon that is seeing the patient. So wound bed preparation guidelines for arterial ulcers. Recommendation number one is level one evidence. Wound bed preparation starts with identification of wound etiology and approving associated medical conditions such as nutrition, blood flow, and awareness. Recommendation number two then is actually on debridement and as it pertains to wound bed preparation and is then further broken down into subgroups. Debridement is the basis of the wound bed preparation. It involves understanding basic concepts as shown by the time principle. There are multiple strategies for wound debridement and the Wound Healing Society then breaks it further into surgical and non-surgical. So recommendation 2A and 2B, level one evidence for both surgical and non-surgical debridement of arterial ulcers. So what's their guidance for the VLUs? So 3.1 is remove all necrotic or devitalized tissue by sharp, enzymatic, mechanical, biologic, or autolytic, autolytic debridement. It is a level one evidence, it's kind of a la carte style as well. 4.2 for VLUs, the initial debridement is required to remove all the obvious necrotic tissue, excessive bacterial burden, and cellular burden of the dead and senescent cells. Maintenance debridement is needed to maintain the appearance and the readiness of the wound bed for healing. The healthcare provider can choose from a number of debridement methods, sharp, enzymatic, mechanical, biologic, or autolytic. And then they say that more than one debridement method may actually be appropriate. So here again is that a la carte style debridement. And the principle that they gave was that the necrotic tissue, excessive bacterial burden, and senescent cells and cellular debris all inhibit wound healing, and that its sharp debridement is often the most adventitious. However, the method of debridement chosen may depend on the status of the wound, the capability of the healthcare provider, the overall condition of the patient, and professional licensing restrictions. And here they actually added excessive debridement. And they say that it can result in a reinstitution of the inflammatory process with a consequent influx of inflammatory cytokines, so not be too aggressive. And then lastly, it's the, the pressure ulcer guidelines. So guideline 3.10 actually includes biofilm and has not really been mentioned in the prior guidelines as being upfront. Level three evidence, it's suggestive data of proof of principle, but lacking sufficient data such as a meta-analysis, randomized control trial, or multiple clinical series. Establishment of a bacterial biofilm contributes to the development of chronic non-healing wounds. A biofilm should be suspected with poorly healing chronic wounds, as well as wounds with high multi-species bacterial burden, and can be identified using molecular microbial identification. Sharp debridement significantly reduces the number of microorganisms in a wound bed, and is vital in biofilm control. Guideline 3.2 has level one evidence. Remove all necrotic or devitalized tissue by sharp, enzymatic, biologic, mechanic, or autolytic debridement. So again, the a la carte style. But here they add larval therapy. They state that it provides debridement and antibacterial activity. Although there are no recent randomized control trials of larval therapy for pressure ulcers, this biologic therapy has been shown to reduce the time to debridement but does not significantly increase the rate of healing in leg ulcers. Guideline 3.9, level three evidence. They went further and actually separated heel ulcers. So heel ulcers do not need debridement if they lack signs of inflammation, infection, and are stable with a dry eschar. The principle here on whether the determination is made to debride heel ulcers actually depends on your clinical goals. And those patients with dry heel eschars who cannot be revascularized have multiple comorbidities and are immobile with no functional goals, the heel eschar may actually be left intact. Heel ulcers with dry eschars should be monitored closely and debrided if they develop signs of infection.
And then the last guideline that we're going to go over is advances in skin wound care. So statement five, when appropriate, debride wounds with adequate pain control. Consider sharp debridement to bleeding tissue for healable wounds and conservative surgical debridement for maintenance or non-healable wounds. So in their guideline, they did achieve consensus for debridement. The relatively lower agreement levels for the statement, though, were likely attributable to facility-related limitations on sharp debridement. So they actually went on to discuss that the procedure itself, debridement, requires clinical experience, appropriate scope of practice, and availability of equipment to perform the procedure and stop bleeding if required. They also created a table of healability and considerations. It included the categories surgical debridement, inflammation, infection management, and moisture management. They make the recommendation of active surgical debridement if it's a healable wound, conservative debridment if it's a maintenance wound, and comfort removal of sloth if it is a non-healable wound. I actually really like what they did here with that healability and the clinical goals. Well, after that literature dive, the standard of care is for debridement. It can be conducted in more than one way with different methods, so an a la carte style, with low supporting evidence for one type over another. The different techniques to undertake debridement include autolytic, which would be your hydrogels, biochemical, like enzymes like a collagenase, biological methods, so our larvae, and then of course, physical, the aggressive scrubbing, blades, curettes, surgical, any surgical debridement tool, and those hydrosurgical um, debridement tools. So the recommendation standard of care for debridement then involves initial debridement, followed by routine debridement to maintain a healthy wound bed to promote wound resolution. The use of sharp debridement may be limited due to patient factors such as pain, insufficient arterial supply, and anticoagulation status. The use of sharp debridement may be limited due to provider factors as well, such as limited experience or skill of the wound care provider, along with the scope of practice or licensing restrictions. Resources may not be accessible due to location and facility-specific products. There could be concern that sharp debridement may cause the patient harm, and thus the provider does not perform the debridement. Multiple modalities exist for achieving hemostasis following wound debridement. The most common modalities utilized in outpatient and patient operative room, room setting include holding pressure, use of various topical hemostatic agents, chemical cautery with silver nitrate, electrocautery, absorbable gelatin sponges, cellulose-based products. The disadvantages associated with current methods of achieving hemostasis Following wound debridement may actually result in limited or no wound debridement being performed. So suboptimal wound debridement or the lack of wound debridement altogether can increase the patient's risk for delayed wound healing and its associated complications. Providers may choose to perform limited wound debridement or avoid it altogether in anticoagulated patient population. This, however, could potentially contribute to delayed wound healing. So an unmet need exists for a cost-effective, rapid, non-caustic hemostatic agent that can be utilized in the surgical, inpatient, and outpatient uh, clinic setting. Use of a chitosin-based hemostatic agent or chitosin-impregnated gauze may actually fill this unmet need. So what is chitosin, you might ask? It is a fast-acting, naturally occurring, biocompatible, biodegradable, non-toxic hemostatic agent that has antimicrobial, antifungal properties with wound healing promoting properties as well. How does it work? It absorbs fluid from the blood, it actually swells and it creates a gel. This gel then forms a plug and that plug seals the wound and stops it from bleeding. So chitosin stops bleeding without causing the tissue injury, which is seen with our other chemical and electrocautery hemostatic modalities. It works independent of the body's normal clotting process. Many common modalities rely on the patient having properly functioning clotting factors and are not indicated for patients on anticoagulation therapy. So is there a literature to support product use? I'm gonna go over some of the, the papers for you. So Keese Group, they evaluated the use of a chitosin-based gelling fiber dressing following wound debridement in the outpatient setting and reported reduced times to achieving hemostasis and reduction in wound size at one week. 
Diaz group stated that chiasm may also increase collagen deposition and organization, potentially increasing the tensile strength of wounds once they are healed. Matisa then went on to describe the biocompatibility, innate and non-toxic properties of chiasm and how they avoid the additional tissue damage is associated with the use of chemical cautery and electrocautery, negating further stress on the patient's natural reparative mechanisms. Both Dia and Matisa demonstrated that chiasm had also been shown to have inherent bacterial static, bactericidal effects, which may exist in infection prevention. The inherent properties of chiasm may also aid in wound healing. That's based on Keese, Dia, and Matisse studies. Chiasm have been demonstrated to provide a three-dimensional extracellular matrix and stimulate microphages, fibroblast proliferation, and keratinocyte delivery, all key components of the proliferative phase of wound healing. Thibodeau conducted a study comparing the use of chiasm-based hemostatic agents to electrocautery following sharp debridement in the operating room setting. He found the use of chiasm-based hemostatic agents resulted in less time to achieve hemostasis and reduced pre-procedure and procedural times. The study included patients on anticoagulation therapy. The time required to achieve hemostasis following sharp debridement was about 10 minutes less with the chiasm-based hemostatic agent than with electrocautery, which was a significant reduction in time. Lastly, Snyder showed the mean time to hemostasis in the chiasm treatment group was about one minute, 19 seconds when compared to five minutes and 19 seconds for the control group. They reported the quality of the granulation tissue at one week after use was significantly improved in the chitosin group. 18 out of 20 patients improved, none deteriorated. Compared to the uh, control group were four out of 20 deteriorated and none improved. So yes, there is literature to support sharp debridement as the standard of care and supporting evidence that chitosin can be effective as a hemostatic agent. Let's look at a retrospective data dive now into patients that were on anticoagulation therapy with wounds that required sharp debridement. The chitosin-based hemostatic agent was used and the incidence of re-bleed was noted. Sharp debridement was performed in all patients. After sharp debridement to bleeding tissue, chitosin-based granules or gauze laminated with granules were applied to the wound following product use guide. So I really have to apologize. I have a lot going on this slide, but I, I couldn't find a good way to separate the, the data tables. So patient demographic, use of anticoagulants, and incidence of intraoperative rebleed were all captured retrospectively. 12 patients on anticoagulant therapy underwent sharp debridement of their wound. All the patients were male. The average patient age was about 69 years. Patients were on average on two anticoagulant medications, which included apixaban, aspirin, clopidogrel, heparin, lovenox, and warfarin, all at the time of debridement. Wound etiologies then included acute and chronic wounds, whether they were due to pressure, diabetes, peripheral arterial disease, mixed arterial disease, venous insufficiency, and trauma. Sharp and or hydrosurgical debridement was performed in all patients in either an outpatient or operated room setting. The level of debridement ranged then from subcutaneous tissue all the way down to bone. A patients had coagulation labs drawn. 25% of those patients had elevated or near critical INR levels. Only one patient had an occurrence of a rebleed following intraoperative surgical debridement. Rebleed did not occur in the two patients with elevated or near critical INR levels who underwent surgical debridement. The cases presented here further support the ability of a chitosin-based hemostatic agent to achieve rapid hemostasis in acute and chronic wounds in patients on anticoagulation therapy. In addition to achieving rapid hemostasis, Use of the chitosin-based hemostatic agent in this case series suggests that its use may also support healing in a variety of ways. The ability to achieve rapid hemostasis allowed for early use of other advanced wound care products to aid in the accelerated wound healing process. One patient in this case series achieved wound resolution following the discontinuation of all advanced wound care products and treatment with debridement and application of the chitosin-based hemostatic agent alone. Debridement is a central component in the standard of care for treatment of acute and chronic wounds. A 28-day reduction in time to healing for diabetic foot ulcers has been reported 
when debridement is included in the treatment protocol, when compared to when debridement is not part of the treatment protocol. Given the accelerated time to healing and incidence of healed wounds, multiple guidelines provide a strong recommendation that standard of care for wounds includes initial and routine sharp debridement. Despite the existence of multiple modalities to achieve hemostasis, there is no gold standard. Currently available hemostatic modalities used in outpatient and patient operating room settings are limited by provider preference, the time required to achieve hemostasis, resource availability, cost, and the potential for causing the patient harm. The results of this case series presented here support the use of the chiasin-based hemostatic agent following guidelined recommended sharp debridement to bleeding tissue in patients on anticoagulation therapy, given its ability to achieve rapid hemostasis. In addition to the ability to achieve rapid hemostasis in this patient population, the use of the chiasin-based hemostatic agent may help expedite wound resolution due to its ability to promote early advanced wound care product use and the potentially beneficial inherent properties of chiasin. This is a really long list of references that I wanted, um, that I used to create this PowerPoint. It wouldn't be a wound care debridement lecture, however, if I did not go over some case examples. So my first case example is a 65 year old man and he's on a Pixaban two weeks following suture removal at another facility for a traumatic wound sustained to the right leg. He's diabetic, he fell on something due to his neuropathy and he said his wound, he had stitches in it, it just completely, opened up. So he came to see me instead of the provider who initially followed up with. Debrement was performed and chiasin-based hemostatic granules were applied. Hemostasis, of course, was achieved and it allowed for adjunctive use of an antibiotic coated collagen dressing at three weeks following the initial presentation. Case example number one. I have a 65-year-old man. He was on a Pixaban two weeks following surgical removal at another facility for a traumatic wound, which he sustained to the right leg. He's diabetic, he has neuropathy, he tripped and fell on something really sharp. I can't remember if it was glass. And he actually had a wound dehiscence. Um, and he decided instead of following up with the local ER that he was gonna to come to my facility. Debrement was performed and a chiasin-based hemostatic granules were then applied. Hemostasis was achieved, allowing for adjunctive use of antibiotic coated collagen dressing at three weeks following initial presentation. The chiasin-based hemostatic granules were applied following weekly debridement as an as needed basis. Wound resolution was achieved at one month. The wound remained healed at 12 months. So here you can see the photos. Um, you can see that nice gash he has in his leg. I applied the granules and then I did that as needed every time I needed to debride. And you can see he goes on to full wound closure. Case example number two, I have a 73 year old male who was on warfarin and anoxaparin and he presented with a freshly active bleeding wound immediately after hitting his leg on his truck. So he was actually in his way to our facility to see a completely different provider, had no appointment with me, but because he's on blood thinners, he had his leg, it was, you know, bleeding through his jeans, down his, down his leg, into his sock. So he came up to clinic as a walk-in. I, of course, applied a chitosin-based topical hemostatic agent, achieved hemostasis, and I did that after I cleaned up his wound and got all the blood off his leg. And then I used uh, silver impregnated collagen product. Chiasin-based hemostatic grounds were applied following weekly application debridements as needed, and then wound resolution was actually achieved in about two weeks, and his wound remains closed. You can see the initial presentation, pretty superficial wound, but because of the blood thinners, he, he was just actively bleeding. I applied the granules, and he is still closed today. My last case is a 72-year-old male, and he has peripheral arterial disease. He presented to the clinic with a wound to the left heel which originated from very ill-fitting shoe gear. He wasn't wearing his diabetic shoes um, that we prescribed for him. He actually needed a vascular intervention. It was performed and the place, patient was placed on clobidogrel for anticoagulation therapy. Treatment began with debridement, of course, and application of chitosin-based granules. Rapid hemostasis allowed for early adjunctive use of anti-coated collagen dressings. I tried silver impregnated collagen dressings, two different types of placental allografts, all to try to expedite healing. Due to the failure of the wound progression though, these advanced treatment modalities, they were actually discontinued. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be my maintenance wound, you know, non-healable. So treatment continued with only removal of the sloth and local, you know, wound care. 
And I would apply the chitin based product afterwards. In this case, I used granules. Well, when you know it, the wound actually began to progress towards resolution with this treatment. So in 10 weeks with just the chitin granules, he had wound closure. So here's his, his wound photos. You can see him actively bleeding, the application of the chitin granules, and he went on to close. However, um, due to all his other comorbidities, he wasn't a healthy gentleman. He did have wound reoccurrence before the 12 month period. Well, I'd like to thank you all very much for spending this time with me. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. That was really a fantastic overview of debridement in the challenging situation and how to do it safely um, with all the challenges that you've you know, discussed with these patients. Uh, and cases. Uh, we're going to just uh, share the screen with your recent article, if you don't mind. I don't and, mind. Uh, yeah. So Dr. Lee, you did this fantastic article for us for the December 2022 issue, and we're going to link uh, in the chat to this one. It's the safe guide to debridement in the challenging clinical setting. Um, and essentially in this one, you emphasize the importance of actually um, using debridement as a standard of care central to acute and chronic wounds. But you also mentioned a paper um, in one of your references that showed, you know, 28 day reduction in time to healing for DFUs, you know, DFUs that actually had debridement as part of the treatment protocol. And, That's correct. Yeah, and certainly in the cases that you showed, essentially that debridement, you, you had an additional versatility um, of the types of patients that you could undertake safe debridement in, isn't that right? That's correct. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, in terms of your clinical practice, you know, you seem to have a lot of patients that are on multiple hemostatic agents, aren't they? Sort of um, adoxaban, pixaban, essentially. Um, what do you think was the, the biggest challenge that you find before you started using uh, Gitsen products? We have a fantastic back, vascular surgeon um, in our facility. So almost everyone gets some type of procedure. <laughs> so before we started using chitin based products, um, really it, it was a challenge. We would have to hold pressure. And luckily we have residents of like, oh, you got to hold pressure here for me. I'm going to go see another patient, you know, and, and come back. Or, or I was stuck using silver nitrate and I would use that in the wounds, but these are non-healing wounds to begin with. And so then I was causing damage to the tissue and I didn't like that. And of course, in the ER, or I mean the OR, you're you're applying electrochemical uh, cautery, right? And that also damages the the area and burns the tissue. So really, having a chitin based product allowed me to debride safely, and I, I don't worry that my patients are on anticoagulation therapy anymore because I know I can apply this product, and they're not going to bleed through their dressing. I'm not going to have to sit there ten minutes holding pressure in my clinic room. Um, it's been such a great addition to the clinic that my residents, they actually carry it in their pockets when they go rounding on the clinic floors for when they, they do their local wound care or even their bedside um, procedures as well. It's been a it's great almost, addition. Yeah, it's, it sounds like it's a real safety net for you in those scenarios where previously, you know, you would have had to have other mechanisms of, of hemorrhage control. Uh, it seems to have given you the added option of avoiding those those techniques that perhaps, you know, as you mentioned, electrocautery that can cause local tissue damage. Thank you very much for joining us for this Global Innovation Summit. Hi, thank you for having me. We're really excited to discuss the future of debridement with you and Dr. Longkey in this segment. Yes, I'm really looking forward to introducing this technology. It's been really instrumental in my practice. Um, and I, I think it's something that needs to be canvassed and, and introduced to the masses. So happy to be here. Yeah, so um, I'm uh, Dr. Tracy Kimball. Um, I've been in the wound care space now almost 10 years. Um, I started right out of vascular surgical training. Um, and uh, so I became a wound care specialist uh, officially in 2016. Um, I've been uh, predominantly working in the post-acute acute care space. Um, I work for PACE program, um, value-based care model, um, and so we provide um, wound management um, treatment for the beneficiaries of the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. So I deal predominantly with uh, the elder segment. Um, I was introduced to Dr. Lonke a few years back um, through the powers of LinkedIn, actually. And uh, we um, have been collaborating on um, 
promulgating this new technology for debridement and wound hygiene. And so, and that is the purpose of the talk today is to introduce uh, this novel tool and technology uh, to be deployed um, and translated from his specialty of OBGYN into my specialty of wound care and wound care surgery. Thank you very much, Dr. Kimball. Whereabouts are you based? I'm based out of Denver, Colorado. Oh, fantastic. Right, beautiful place. And Dr. Long, you're out in California, isn't that right? Yes, I live in Southern California. I'm originally from New York. I trained med school in New York and college and did my residency in OBGYN in Harbor UCLA and eventually became a physician in Kaiser Permanente and then leadership through being elected to the board of directors of the Southern California Permanente Medical Group, which is Kaiser Permanente for uh, 15 years uh, until about 2018. And I've been an inventor and entrepreneur in the field, mostly in my OBGYN field, but also wound care, believe it or not, with traumatic wounds and now chronic wounds, and um, have brought the technology that has really taken on a following in OBGYN to atraumatically remove tissue cervical biopsies into the wound care space for debridement and tissue sampling. So hopefully we'll be able to convey the excitement of the versatility of what we've developed. Thank you very much to Dr. Lonky, Dr. Kimball for joining us for this segment, which is about the future of debridement. And you're both, you know, seasoned clinical professionals. You've been in this wound care space for a long time. So you have had the benefit of the vision of where we've come from in, you know, the evolution of debridement, as well as the current status quo and what technologies are available. And in essence, you're going to take us on a, a little trip to the future of debridement. So thank you very much. And uh, perhaps uh, you can start uh, our discussion now. So I'm Dr. Neil Lonke. I'm the founder of Histologics. I'm a former elected director of Kaiser Permanente's medical groups, SCPMG. And I'm a clinical professor of OBGYN at East University of California, Irvine. I've been a serial entrepreneur and I've developed this technology in the women's healthcare space. It's It's actually had uh, over 1.5 million clinical uses in the United States alone to remove tissue from the body and the cervix. And some of the evidence I'm going to show today, it's translatable from tissue-based studies in the lower genital tract to wounds. And I'd also like to uh, thank Tracy Kimball, who is the wound care guru surgeon, who is the developer of WISH Innovations, the founder of that. She's also an excellent teacher. And when we get to the clinical part of this presentation, she's going to masterfully, through the master class, teach us a little bit about what's happening at the tissue-based level. So with that, let me start by saying that the mission of Histologics as a founding company is to uh, atraumatically, compassionately save lives from, by doing the kind of procedures like biopsies or debridement that are needed that people shy away from because sometimes they think of uh, selective surgical debridement or even mechanical debridement or even wound hygiene as being traumatic. So we're trying to bring a new technology, a physical technology that's easy to deploy into the marketplace and do it in an evidence-based manner. So we're trying to look at the reusable cutting surgical stainless steel tools. Some of the technology in wound debridement has become uh, disposable instruments, but some are still single use, uh, multiple use uh, reusable. They need to be cleaned, sterilized, repackaged, and restocked. We're replacing a cutting action with a single sharp edge with a series of frictional tissue, uh, let's just say, fibers or curettes that are going to enter the wound and going to uh, more gently, frictionally debond the tissue from the wound base. Uh, some of the tissue that's removed can be used for diagnostics as well. And this is the tissue. It's called Kylon. There are brush curettes. They're frictional tips when they kind of resemble Velcro a little bit, maybe a little more than a little bit, but they uh, are re-engineered so that when they're pressed flat, they convert to curettes. And they easily remove and can trap necrotic debris, as long as the, the trapped tissue is semi-solid and not completely solid. These hooks deploy continuously without a problem. 
and uh, we guide you towards the kind of wounds that these can be used with. Uh, we're moving something from that's thought of invasive to minimally invasive, and there's lots of evidence in the literature about doing that. You know, cardiac casts became stents. The surgeons used to make fun of a gynecologist doing laparoscopy until they realized they could do a cholecystectomy through a scope, and then all of a sudden it became standard of care. Uh, we've moved to minimally invasive gynecologic surgery, but I would say in the procedure room outpatient setting, all the endoscopy procedures that used to be done under in an OR or, or surgical, minimal surgical procedures can be done at outpatient. And I just thought of like the hyperbaric chamber to the topical oxygen therapy. That's not really a surgical procedure, but it's something where you're trying to make it more accessible and not as cumbersome. And I think that's what we're trying to do with the wound care. Uh, again, soft biopsy and soft DCC are the products in the gynecologic space, and they are replacing the stainless steel punch biopsy and working curette with 1.5 million biopsies in the United States thus far. These are the wound care SKUs. We're going to go over each of them. Soft biopsy, soft biopsy D, KRET, and soft KCOT are the ones we're going to discuss today as far as debridement. We'll spend a little bit of time on biopsy as well. But in the context of value-based care, because Kaiser Permanente is a ca capitated system, I really cut my teeth learning how to prevent, how to uh, present value in the marketplace, which means that you're going to have to establish quality of what you're trying to convert. And service means ease of use, um, uh, throughput, and access means throughput, I mean, and services, the patient care experience and the provider ease of use and the integration into the healthcare system over the cost. Uh, Kylon Medical Fabric is FDA registered as Kylon hook nylon bristles that are both a biopsy device and a tissue trap container. It's also registered as a, as a series of micro curettes. So you get epithelial biopsy capable, you get curettage capable, and you've got a pathology specimen that can go into to a lab, all in one. On the left, you see the OBGYN tools that have been replaced, and you see the tissue-trapped uh, ectocervical biopsy material. And on the right, you see the reusable or disposable conventional debridement tools being converted into the curette or the finger cut, or the applicator biopsy tool, which you'll see uh, a demonstration of. This is what you're used to. And the, the tools that you see on the left are really, uh, you know, early 1900s developed. They're useful, especially when you have solid tissue. And uh, for refashioning wound edges, the blade is the standard of care but you'll see that some of the Kylon technology can replace most of the left and not much of the right with the blade, but some. Uh, this is the biopsy tool called soft biopsy. The bottom is soft K-RET. The top is for flat wounds. The bottom is for crevices, for shallow tunnels, or folds like interdigitary space in the feet. And then you'll see the soft biopsy D in the middle, which is the clear device, which is fortified to do a longer debridement episode. So in this talk, we're gonna mostly talk about soft biopsy plus D because you can both do a prolonged debridement episode or it can do a single biopsy as well. The top soft biopsy is more of a lab tool. Think of a swab and then think I can get deeper and soft biopsy is the tissue collection. You see the little score mark that's for snapping and detaching the tip. Again, a little closer view. It's a trumpet shaped tip. It's rounded, it's almost a half an inch. It can, it can uh, debride or biopsy an area of, uh, let's say three by three centimeters would be the upper limits of where this would be efficient. It can excavate the tissue and trap it simultaneously. And for wound-based biopsy, it's great to get to the biofilm below the surface of the debrided wound surface, as you'll see, and that's how it works. There's a brush at the left when it's rubbed lightly. It can be rubbed in all different directions, but when it's pressed and twisted and rotated like key turning, it turns into a, uh, a curatage uh, system. 
Not only is it excavating through the epithelium into the dermis, it can get into the subcutaneous tissue if you so desire. I think that's about the limits of the depth of what this can do as a surgical debridement tool. So I'm gonna let Tracy narrate this part So this is our soft biopsy device. As you can see, the technician is holding the device parallel and per excuse me, perpendicular to the skin and the wound base. Uh, there's a, a more um, coned out uh, representation of the method. Um, there's a pressing and twisting motion um, and then a collection of morselized cellular tissue that will then be snapped off and placed into the specimen container for evaluation for either aerobic, anaerobic culture, medium, PCR, NGS, um, to give better diagnostics of what's going on with the tissue and the biofilm. Thanks, Tracy. So Tracy, so Tracy you would be using that in, in the sort of clinical scenario of uh, a longstanding ulcer, potentially, a hard to heal ulcer. I mean, that one certainly looked obviously a medial aspect of the, the lower leg, across the close to the ankle joint. So are those typically the types of patients that you're using obviously this method of debridement that you're correct, capturing correct yeah for it's a it's it's obviously a thorough diagnostic in this regard right because we are stimulating removing um tissue and doing a, a small biopsy of uh of that wound base um and so that's you know aggravating the tissue and inciting an uh -huh. acute phase response but but the intention of this um is to capture uh, a, a morselized aliquot of tissue, similar to if you were going to do a conal biopsy on the cervix, but we're now translating it to the wound bed and sending it off for um, for culture and uh, and potentially genomics. Um, because this is disrupted um, architecture, wouldn't necessarily be congruent with a punch biopsy. But um, but yes, uh, you know we're 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 advertising this predominantly for um, sampling of tissue for uh, culture and determination if there is some chronic um, biofilm um, component that's creating the senescent chronic state. I have a little bit um, of evidence on that uh, I'd like to get to. So that's exactly. Okay. Correct, and I appreciate that. This think of this as a replacement for the swab to do molecular testing for the wound base, but it's also a debridement device as well. And you want to have a clean wound to get to the base. So that's what that's what you're aiming for for the sample, and it's placed in the vial for transport. You're not going to use the dead slough on the surface. It's mostly going to be staph aureus. You got to get below the base, and you want to get that's for sampling. And that's the snap at the recess, and that's dropping it in the vial for the molecular testing. But the longer procedure, soft biopsy plus D, is not only used for sampling wounds as a replacement for a swab, but actually can do the debridement. So I kind of snuck in a little bit about biopsy in here, even though this is the future of debridement, because these devices are have a dual purpose. I like the theragnostic word that Tracy used. So this is precise layer by layer debridement. It can be conservative mechanical, it can be non-selective, very gentle. It can be conservative excisional selective. It has a very wide range of utility. The one thing it cannot do is cut away solid tissue or highly fibrotic tissue very easily. Can it do it? Yes, but it's a prolonged procedure versus a sharp. So Tracy's gonna narrate this particular case it's very brief. It's the old soft biopsy being used as a debrider before the new D was developed. So. so as you can see, the technician here is, is approaching the shallow ulcer of the medial ankle. Um, there is, uh, you know, thin fibrin, slough, and uh, debris. Um, and uh, so that is essentially what we're describing as a translation of uh, Mohs surgery for the wound. Yeah, we're going layer by layer. Exactly. The Mohs surgery was coined by another person who's used this, Mark Susky. He's a plastic surgeon in California. And he describes as I can precisely go layer by layer. I don't have to worry about cutting too deep with a sharp instrument. I can I can gauge how deep I go with this. And, yeah, um, and it's with it's with gentle pressure, um, but you're pushing into the tissue and it's grabbing it and furling those uh, tips to make them more um, 
yeah. to, to, uh, to unfurl the sharp edges for it to be a cutting yeah. tool. Right. It's a gentle brush when it's upright like that. You can see the blue device with the upright longer hooks. And then when it's flattened, all those tips become curettes. This was used in OBGYN, and this is a translational study that I'm showing you here, because we can't debride a wound with a frictional device or biopsy it, and then uh, within 30 days, take a scoop of the wound and look at it under the microscope and see what's happening at the molecular level. But luckily for OBGYN, when we biopsy away dysplasia and we have to treat it, we do a wide local excision called a loop excision or a cone biopsy, and we can look at the tissue. And in the dermis and upper subcutaneous tissue, within 30 days of frictional tissue removal, you see a pretty robust uh, immune response. The immune response is evident by a proliferation or a attraction of plasma cells and lymphocytes that is pretty stark. This is a viral induced disease. So you see that. And the theory in the conclusion of this publication from the journal Repro Medicine was that this was a frictional adjuvant type effect with heat uh, attracting the immune response, releasing the pathogens into the tissue milieu. So we don't know if this is exactly what's going to happen with wounds, but this was something that we're trying to bring over and teach because uh, we want more studies to be done to see if there's an immune effect as well. Of course, biofilm is a large reason why wounds don't heal. And if we have a way to induce an inflammatory immune response while we're debriding a wound, that's something that might be of value in the future. So the soft K-cot is deployed on a finger. You can see the fabric. The nice thing about a fabric, you can put it on a lot of tiff surfaces and we wanted to make it larger. People were saying, we love your device, but we wish we could do larger wounds. So we're using it to debride larger wounds with a paintbrush technique, a pressurized sweeping for lighter excisional debridement, flattening and twisting to its size. We're looking for micropunctate bleeding and Tracy's done some nice work on this as far as looking at bringing some controlled bleeding into the wound base to accelerate healing as a potential way to do it. There are some blood products on the market right now they are trying to do that. And uh, we also make the caveat that if you have a black eschar with a very high, highly fibrotic or solid wound, you probably have a use for the sharps. This is not going to replace everything in the market. So Tracy did these two cases that are coming up next, and I want her to narrate them. So this first uh, was a diabetic um, asensate patient. There, of course, there's no um, there was no sound, but I uh, used the KCOT in this uh, in this venue. Um, she had thin fiber and slough that was semi adherent, semi solid, and she had also some hyperkeratosis to the wound margin. Um, so uh, as I deployed the the finger cot on my index finger and used a sweeping motion. Um, with some additional pressure, I was stimulating the wound bed at the same time, um, removing that thin fiber and slough and causing that micropunctate bleeding. Do not use it in a gauze pad because it does get stuck, but we like to demonstrate the reason. Um, and uh, the best way to clean that brush out is to use a, dr a couple drops of, of, you know, of saline in its packaging and then use your other um, other nail to uh, to dip that in there and, and clean it out. Yeah, that's on the instruction trees. Yeah. And then this second uh, patient was a venous leg ulcer in a, di a diabetic end-stage renal disease patient who also has calciphylaxis. And, um, and so in this regard, we had it on my thumb. I was more perpendicular to him because the way he was laying in the bed um, and this, this didn't really have a significant amount of slough or necrosis. It was just stalled. Um, and uh, he also has some skin islands there that we were able to evolve, avoid. But the indication here was to create that stimulated micropunctate bleeding in that wound bed. Yeah, there's no need. Thank you, Tracy. There was no need to clean out the fabric hooks with that type slough. And she did use the gauze briefly. Some people have even tried to use a sharp to try to clean it. We we teach against that. These are nylon hooks. They're not fragile, but if you start pulling on them or cutting them, they're going to uh, degrade. So we don't want you to do that. Um, so I want to get to the last device, which truthfully is our endocervical biopsy tool that absolutely works wonderfully as a debridement tool for the interjudiciary space, the shallow 
crevice or mild tunnel where you can still visualize the tip of the device. This is another handle-based device. This is a poster from SAWC, and you can see that the debridement occurred at the base of the first toe beautifully with a nice out, and then they were able to take another device and take a sample from the wound base to look for biofilm. And this is a case that a podiatrist did. Tracy will narrate it. This shows you the benefit of using two technologies in one case. So yes, yeah, so this uh, this the KRET device is really um, utilized in this capacity to get underneath the undermining hood um, and getting into that tunnel uh, at the base of that wound. And then he switched to a scalpel to fashion those wound edges and, and make them more sloped so that the epithelial uh, transition can begin to migrate. Right. I'm going to go into a little a video that we did to summarize some of this. I'm going to introduce you to the Kylon medical fabric and the instruments used for wound debridement today. This is Kylon fabric on what we call the soft biopsy plus D, which means that it not only can take a biopsy, it can also debride wounds. It's good for three by three centimeter wounds and can do selective or non-selective debridement. I'm going to show you the wound hygiene level, the mechanical debridement level, and the selective surgical debridement level using this product. When the hooks are upright, it's a brush that traps tissue. And when it's flattened, they turn into curettes. And you'll feel that when you put it on your own hand uh, to use some of the non-sterile for demo. So a very light stroking will allow for some wound hygiene. But some moderate raking, you can see that there's now a deeper debridement going on. That's mechanical into dermis. But if you find a semi-solid spot or you got to have to get into the subcutaneous space, you press and twist it and rotate it. And you can see I've made a crater here. Um, if I need how do you, how do you protect it? Area, well, like up to six. Go ahead. Oh, sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Um, if, if you were in an area like uh, the video that Tracy narrated, so you were close to the bones, the wound was, say, medial malleolus, what, what's the best way to protect the, the bone from being exposed when you're using the technique? What sort of tips or tricks do you have? Well, with the bone, believe it or not, the nylon hooks won't will not affect bone. So you're Perfect. not you're not going, to, that's one of the safety features of using uh, the nylon hooks is that you're not going to get into that uh, sharp methodology. Um, you can moderate the pressure. What do you think, Tracy? Yeah, I think that the the tensile strength of the peritinon and the periosteum and then the bone itself. I mean, if you got into brittle bone, uh, that would obviously be a good thing because you'd be sampling potentially an osteonecrosis or osteomyelitis. But this is for semi-solid or um, or gelatinous tissue. Um, this would not excise healthy, viable uh, connective tissue or healthy, viable calcific calcific or calcified bone. Um, right. So, yeah. Thank you. All Thanks. right. I'm going to keep going. By six, the same Kylon fabric can be deployed on a finger cut, which I'm going to show you now. And this finger cut can be steadied with your thumb. It's got the same Kylon hook array and the same debridement levels of mechanical or selective by pressing and twisting, flattening the hooks, turning them into curettes, while also in trap tissue. Sometimes when you're debriding and you're doing a lot of solid tissue, you might get a lot of entrapped tissue. You may feel that it's uh, holding back some of the hooks from working, which is rare. But if so, the package that it comes in can be peeled back to about that level and filled with some sterile fluid or some hypochlorous acid. And once there's some liquid in there, I'm going to show you that we can immerse the tip and clean it really effectively without having particulates flying out and disturbing the environment. And by cleaning it out, you can see 
that I've cleaned it and I'm able to continue to do it. And I only advise you to use it once for that. You won't need to use it more than once if you're using these for small wounds. These are for six by six. Once you've diverted the wound base and you have exposure of biofilm, the soft biopsy is really a single use and that's for taking a biopsy. It's not as fortified as the soft biopsy plus D. It's great for a brief excavation and a biopsy of the wound base where you trap tissue and then you can separate it at the score mark and send it for culture, molecular testing, or even histology. These are tangential biopsy specimens. They're not punch biopsies. They're curettings that are trapped within a hook array. Last but not least, because these are mounted perpendicular to the wound, they're good for flat wounds, but what about if it's in a crevice? What if the wound's between the toes or in a fold in the, in the, in the skin? or even a shallow tunnel. You always want to see the hook while you're debriding. You don't want to go blind into tunnels, but let's say it's the toe space. You can actually press the hooks down and rotate this and rub it, and you'll be able to debride the wound. Especially at the nail bed, sometimes you can actually shave away debris at the nail bed or use the rounded tip to kind of clean out the tip as well. So, all of these have the capability of sending to the lab for a sample. Usually you don't want to send in necrotic debris. You want to have a pre-debrided wound and you want to be able to take the sample separately. Even the soft biopsy plus D can be used for this as well. It's got a score mark as well. So let me go back to the value equation I showed you at the beginning and talk about why this is something that might be effective for most settings. So this is a tangential biopsy approach, which means that you can cover a wide surface area in a lot in a shorter amount of time. Time is, is of extreme value. You can guide the depth. Guiding the depth means you won't have an inadvertent perforation of some microvasculature or some vasculature that needs bleeding uh, control. And you're gonna get a good tissue yield and abundant specimen every time when you see the entrapped tissue for a tissue sample for a biopsy. So it both removes the tissue and traps it, nearly all of it. You don't have to go back in the wound that you've scraped and go try to collect tissue. And it's a disposable, medically recyclable acrylic medical plastic. The service part of it, the intention, certainly in OBGYN, we're finding this anecdotally in wound care uh, with some testimonials we have where we're... we're we're trying to do a, a survey study now with a core of nurse practitioners to show that this is a minimally invasive approach. It's a gentler biopsy experience or gentle biopsy experience. Um, it's the approach is try to be gentle, but try to be effective. Uh, and it's a wide sample that you're getting. So your time is also service oriented because patients don't like three minute debridements. You know, if you're using a, a gauze or some other cloth or something, it takes a long time and the friction does hurt and uh, they want something that's brief. And let's go a little bit more about the quality and the evidence of the biopsy. And I want to just say that PCR is coming about and PCR requires a sample that's going to reach the biofilm. And uh, biopsies are multiple publications. There's a bigger presentation on the Histologics website, some webinars, including Dr. Gregory Schultz. And uh, this has been something that I think could be a breakthrough because it's basically taking what the Levine Z sampling of a swab tries to do, but actually get tangential biopsy uh, samples from the wound base deeply, get to the anaerobes, trap them automatically, standardize how you collect it, bring it to the lab, and get some signal strength with PCR, with NGS, or conventional culture, because it's the sample. The sample can be brought to any technology that evaluates the organisms. Uh, and biopsies, don't be afraid, because they don't compromise wound healing. If you need to do them, do them. So you can analyze the wound when you need to, or find out what's in there. And this is this uh, evidence-based research that was presented at Saucy Fall in 2021 when we kicked this off to show that we're truly getting biopsy samples in the lower left, that the PCR wound pathogen panel was extremely robust, including anaerobes. And it shows pretty much some of the technique we've already showed you. 
So we'll link to those videos and we'll link to them for the audience um, in that chat below. And any questions you have to ask um, from Dr. Kimball and Dr. Longkey, please, as we're presenting, uh, please feel free to add any questions into the live chat. Um, and also we'll link to all those papers that Dr. Lonke mentioned and the video links are also in the chat. So I'm going to conclude by just talking about wound grafts because there's a lot of uh, excitement and evidence about the various ways that grafts or biologics can be brought into wounds to enhance the healing of a wound. We don't sell that. You know, at Histologics, they don't sell that. We sell the means to get a really good prep. And we can actually do an excisional surgical debridement of the wound base in a pretty standardized manner and a pretty rapid uh, methodology. We'd like to invite clinicians to do this and then to publish it because we're trying to show that uh, this is uh, something that can stimulate a wound uh, while it's you know preparing for that wound base. If you don't debride a wound, let's just go back to the basics. If you don't debride sufficiently, the chance the wound graft is going to uptake and integrate is less. That's been shown. So we're just giving you a, a broader, quicker, maybe standardized way of doing this uh, for the wound base. And then all the codes that you're used to for all of the procedures that you're doing, debridement procedures, they fit because we have a wide spectrum of depth of the debridement that we can do, as you see. This is just a summary slide to show you what we have. Uh, this kind of summarizes what the value-based tenets of the product are, minimally evasive design, tactile approach, gentle debridement at your fingertips. Uh, we're trying to make it quick, easy, standardized, effective, patient-friendly, affordable. And uh, there's some stuff at the bottom here about all the government, any of you who are in government agencies, these are all the government um, uh, distribution uh, avenues for you to get this product. Uh, so in conclusion, the Kylon fabric allows for a minimally invasive tissue care, biopsy and debridement. Uh, biopsy is the standard of care for wound-based culture and molecular analysis, analysis of bioform when we just make it standardized and easy to do. Uh, compassionate biopsy and debridement will be preferred by patients. We know that. They fear sharps. Very few patients fear a finger. Uh, the versatility of Kylon is either a brush for non-selective wound hygiene type debridement or a curette array for excisional surgical selective debridement, make it uniquely valuable in the market. And, uh, you know, like I said, nobody fears the finger. And it, this is around a $5 US dollar price range for this product. It varies by uh, how the system brings the product in and who's selling it. But for the most part, we try to make this competitive and affordable um, as a minimally invasive tool that's an alternate to the 1900 sharp instruments, it's versus the newer minimally invasive instruments. This is certainly more affordable than the newer ones. And the older ones, you're looking for a value-based advantage, which you lose maybe in pricing, you gain in efficiency, patient care experience, compliance, and all the things in the value-based equation that make it really uh, valuable for most practices. So with that, I wanna thank uh, the Wound Masterclass hosts for hosting Tracy Kimball and I, and we appreciate being able to be able to teach this technology today. Thank you very much, Dr. Longy and Dr. Kimball. It's been such a interesting journey into looking at all the different technologies that you know, are encompassing that future of debridement. Um, what would you say is the most common questions clinicians ask you whenever you're presenting sort of the future of debridement and this technique? What sort of, what are the sort of common questions clinicians come to you with? The most common thing is, what is that thing? <laughs> and they say, I, you know, like, what is it? Is it a, is it a, <laughs> is it a is it a mechanical debridement tool? Is it a, I can't believe it's a sharp debridement tool. Is it, what is that thing? And they, I say it's what you need it to be at the time when you see the wound. The only thing it isn't is a, a sharp cutting edge tool that can remove 
solid fibrotic debris, everything else, I think it's a tissue removal device. Think of it like you're removing tissue for diagnostics or therapeutics. So it's got all, it, the, the, the bottom line answer is it's a very versatile uh, paradigm shifting technology that people have to learn about the way that we taught it today to understand the physics of it, to, to know that, that it can do all that. And then they, the second common question is, how do I get paid to do that? And I say, well, there's an A code. It's a miscellaneous surgical code. Um, if you're looking to get reimbursed for this $5 tool, uh, on average, 5 to $6, you know, maybe some insurers will, others won't. But the bottom line is all of the, all of the methodologies that you can do with either non-selective mechanical or selective surgical, except for the deeper debridement codes, you can do with this tool. So we're just replacing, giving you a patient-friendly option. That's those are the two most common questions I get about it because it's and, so new. Uh, people don't know what it is, so they ask, you know, what is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was really interesting seeing those interactive patient videos from your clinic setting on actually how the device was used um, in real time, essentially uh, step by step instructions. Uh, so, Doctor Kimball, what what do you feel about the pain tolerance of this procedure, this technique? Um. The question that, you know, doesn't necessarily come up, but should just be implied is, does it hurt? Um, and uh, and the answer is, it depends. <laughs> uh, and patients uh, that have been treated in the system for very long times with other sharper instruments um, that have pain have a psychological response to anything that's going to potentially hurt them. Um, and so I typically do lead in with... Um, a uh, uh, an anesthetic of some sort, whether it's a topical spray on lidocaine solution or a cream or an ointment, um, and so. But the the purpose, the the general consensus is that it's a more compassionate approach, where you would have to potentially use less or none uh, from an anesthetic standpoint. You know, it's a common misconception that debridement isn't painful because the tissue is not alive it's necrotic but in fact as clinicians we know that that's not true and you know I, I suppose that's one of the leading advantages of this new technique and technology that's why uh, we call it wound hygiene I think the hygiene level which many nurses need to just maintain wounds and I say nurses because nurses do a lion's share of maintaining wounds between episodes of debridement or maybe even doing some wound hygiene um, I think that level is intended to be minimally invasive. And I think the testimonials that we've received have reflected that. It's when you get into the highly pressurized uh, excisional level. I think Tracy's point about using topical anesthesia and being mindful is extremely perceptive and correct. So I would, that we have a poster that's hopefully going to be presented this next uh, um society of advanced wound care and uh it's there are some anecdotal case there's not act as case studies of people who could not be debrided in the office setting that were able to be debrided in the outpatient setting using a topical and the chylon so hopefully we'll show that thank you and dr Lonky, do you think that this is a technique that should be amenable to all caregivers all levels of oh. um yeah, we have, that's, we have, that's really good that you asked that question too. It's a great because question. Yeah, we, we have a, an instruction for use for simple wound, wound hygiene for non advanced wound care providers who are just trying to sweep necrotic slough off wounds more effectively. And we have an instruction for use for advanced wound care providers that show the versatility of all levels. So we purposefully teach the people who are not trained not to flatten hooks and convert them to curettes that keep it as a brush so when it's a brush it's a cleaning tool when it's a curette array it's certainly a surgical debridement tool and then you've got the spectrum in between and i think in a, in a skilled nursing facility um practice where the cadence of wound care is a lot faster um, and the volume is a lot faster. 
because their litter patients are literally room after room after room and the team just goes one after another. When you can offer a product that can that can enhance uh, the cleaning of uh, of that wound base, it can stimulate the healing and you have the comfort of, of uh, and the compassion that it can provide. Um, I think it's really poised and placed in terms of a tool for the appropriately scoped uh, clinician, i.e. the bedside nurse that's doing the, the hygiene on a daily basis. Um, so once again, speaking to the versatility of, of, of its use and of course the scope of practice in which deploys, you know, who deploys it on their finger. So thank you very much to both of you. Uh, we've thank really you. enjoyed hosting you and um, we masterclass and uh, we hope you um, enjoyed interacting with the audience. And I thank you both for your time this evening. And we look forward to more questions from our audience now uh, through the live chat. Thank you to all of you at home who've been watching us um, for the last hour, hour or so. Um, we've really enjoyed interacting with you and finding out about your clinical practice. Um, you can catch this episode of the Summit series, the first one, um, which is available on demand on our website. Um, and it's also on all um, platforms, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes. It's the same as Apple Podcasts, isn't it? Um, website and um, which other ones? Yeah, that's it, I think. Yeah, that's, that's it. Um, so... Thank you for joining us. We'll see you at the next event, 21st of June, Palliative Wound Care, um, Solutions and Challenges. Um, don't forget to register to join us for that one. The next summit series is going to be at the end of June. Um, so um, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Good night.